Mr. Dion will not monetize. Okay. We go. All right. KSP 301. Last class, we finished off uh, chapter seven. And then I said, let's take a look at some uh, problems from the end of the book. And I think the question 7.75 is a really great question. There's many parts to it, but it goes over all the different mechanisms that we covered SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. So let's get started on the first one. We have a secondary alkyl halide, right? We have a secondary alkyl halide, and then we have a strong base, which is a weak nucleophile, right? So it's T-butoxide or potassium T-butoxide would be a strong base, but it's a terrible, terrible nucleophile because it's so sterically hindered, so weak nucleophile. So the only thing that's gonna happen here are E2 reactions. There's gonna be nothing but E2 reactions. Now, um, can anybody tell me how many types of beta protons do we have in this molecule? All right, if we zoom in on this guy, this is an alpha carbon here. How many types of beta protons do we have? Maybe I could make that alpha a little bigger. How many types? There, exactly. Thanks, Kiana. Exactly, right? We have uh, a beta proton here, and then we have some beta protons here. And so we can get elimination happening from either of those places. Now, the major product, is it going to be the Hoffman product or the Zaitsev product? I'll try not to quiz you too much on a Monday, on a rainy Monday. <laughs> What's going to be the major product? Would it be the Hoffman or the Zaitsev? Is it going to pull off preferentially the red proton or the blue proton, potassium T-butoxide? Anybody since it's such a sterically hindered base? Yes, thanks, Savannah. It's going to be the Hoffman product, right? So our major product is going to be this compound. So this will be our major product. And then we're also going to get the minor product where we get the Zaitsev product like this, but we're not done yet, right? Can anybody tell me there's one more product that I'm missing here? Can anybody tell me what it is? Exactly, exactly. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so I have the, this is the Hoffman product. That's gonna be the major product. And then there's two Zaitsev products, right? There's this one and this one. There's a trans product and there's a cis product, right? These are both technically, you could call these both Zaitsev products, but we get both of them, right? And if you're wondering why do I get two, it's because you have two beta protons here and they have a different relationship to the chlorine, right? One of them is on the same face of the molecule and the other one is on the back face of the molecule. But anyhow, there you go. All right, next one, we have a primary alkyl halide. So here's our alpha carbon, we have a primary. We have sodium hydroxide. So hydroxide is a strong base. Oh, you bet your bobby socks it is. And it's a strong nucleophile, strong nucleophile. So we're gonna get some E2 and some SN2 here. Could anybody tell me what mechanism is gonna predominate here? Would it be SN2 or E2 on a primary alkyl halide? And it's not a trick question. Yes, exactly, right? SN2 is gonna be the major pathway. And so we're going to draw this, right? We just get a nucleophilic attack, loss of leaving group. And we're also going to get some E2. Now, keep in mind that there's only one beta proton here, or one type of beta proton. There's no cis or trans when you get a terminal alkene. So we're going to get some of this compound as well. We call this compound 1-butene. We'll cover alkene nomenclature in the next chapter. But there we go. So this is our major product, the alcohol that comes from SN2. And then this is the E2 product over here. All right, let's take a look at C. C is a good problem because you get so many different products. So let's take a quick peek at it here. We start out with this secondary alkyl halide and now we treat it with sodium. I'm gonna put the charges in here, ethoxide. And we know that ethoxide is a strong base, strong nucleophile, isn't it? So strong base, strong nucleophile. Now we have a secondary alkyl halide. And so what mechanism is gonna predominate? Would it be SN2 or E2 when it's secondary? Anybody tell me? Exactly, thanks Kiana. It's gonna be the E2 that predominates, right? But now we have an unhindered base. And so we have technically three types of beta protons, but I've been describing it as two. And so the major product is going to be the one where it abstracts the blue proton, isn't it, right? We're going to get a mixture of 
the trans product and the cis product. Now, which one of these is gonna be the major product? It's gonna be the one that's less sterically hindered. So this would be our major product. Then of course, if we pull off the blue pro, or sorry, the red proton, we're gonna end up with this compound. And then we're also gonna get the SN2 product, right? So if we do nucleophilic attack and loss of leaving group, remember when you have an SN2 reaction, you get inversion of configuration. So now, the new group, the ethoxy group, is going to be going back into the page. And so those are all the products we, we get. And if you're sitting there wondering, and I know you're not, but yes, you do have to be able to identify all of these products. Let's try another one. This one we have not a primary or a secondary, but a tertiary alkyl halide. So you're definitely not going to get any substitution on a tertiary, right? Uh, if you're using a strong base or strong nucleophile, you wouldn't solve all of this, but here we're using sodium ethoxide, right? So sodium ethoxide, we have a tertiary alkyl halide. It's a strong, or sorry, we have sodium ethoxide. It's a strong base, wrote this down before, strong base, strong, strong nucleophile. And so what are we gonna get here? We're only gonna get E2 occurring. Now there's two types of beta protons here. We have these ones in red, and then we have these ones in blue over here. So if I pull off, um, or sorry, um, if you look at those two protons, since we have an unhindered base, if we pull off the proton in blue, that's gonna give us the major product, which would be this, okay? So this will be our major product, the Zaitsev product. And then the Hoffman product, that's not very pretty, the Hoffman product, there we go, is gonna be the minor product. Now, is this, can I have cis and trans with this compound? What I have in the red circle. Can this can this exist as cis and trans? And it's not a trick question designed to fool you. Exactly. Thanks, Sean. The answer is no. Okay. Remember, when you have a carbon that has two groups that are identical to it, right? Your double bond double bonded carbon, if it has two two groups that are identical, cis and trans are impossible. It can't be either of those. So we'll just delete that whole kit and caboodle. And there we go. We have two products and the Zaitsev is going to be the major. All right. I'm going to go, let's go over E, and then we'll go over F. F is a really good one, so let's take a look at E. So again, this is question 7.75 from our textbook, Klein 4th edition. And in E, we have an aromatic ring, and we have a secondary alkyl halide. I want to draw it correctly. Here we go. And we're using sodium ethoxide. So the methoxide and the reaction is done in ethanol. So we have a secondary alkyl halide and we have a strong base, strong nucleophile. And so we're gonna get, um, so strong base, right? Strong, strong nucleophile. So the predominant mechanism is going to be E2. So how many beta carbons do I have that have protons on them here? Maybe I'm asking the question a little bit differently this time, right? Here's alpha, right? We know that on the aromatic ring, we've got a beta carbon. And then over here, we've got a beta carbon. How many of the, out of the blue and the green, do both of them have protons or just one? Could anybody answer that? So they don't both, right? Because pH stands for aromatic ring. Right, so if we draw in an aromatic ring like this, right, there's no carbons attached to this, or sorry, there's no hydrogens attached to this carbon here, right? But the one that I have in green has got two beta protons. So let's go this one and this one, right? Okay, does that make sense now? No, no protons on the aromatic ring, car, no, maybe I'll highlight it in yellow just so I can refer to it, right? There's no protons attached here, okay. So again, our major mechanism is going to be E2. And so we're going to end up with something that looks like this. So let's see if I can not butcher this. So we're going to end up with this compound, which is the trans compound, but we're also going to end up with the cis compound, which looks like this. Now the trans compound is going to be the major compound or the major product, I should say. Why? Because it's less sterically hindered. And we're also going to get a little bit of SN2 in this one as well. So if we draw the SN2 product, remember that occurs with inversion of configuration. So we'll put our ethoxy group. And there we go. 
All right, let's look at the big one, which is problem F, which is a problem that involves stereo specificity. So I'm going to clean the page off here. This is 7.75 F. Okay, very important problem. Uh, it shows up on the final exam sometimes, a problem about stereo specificity. So I wanted to cover one more with you before we finished up the chapter. So bromine is here, and then we have a methyl group going in back like this. So the last problem was stereoselective, right? It was stereoselective for the trans over the cis. Why? Because the trans is more stable, right? It's less sterically hindered. But if you remember, we said um, that the uh, elimination, so this uh, compound, I didn't even put the reagent in here, it's being treated with sodium methoxide, which is a strong base, strong nucleophile. So strong base, strong nucleophile. So E2 is going to predominate. We're going to get a little bit of SN2, but let's not worry about that yet. Let's draw the, the E2 product first. Um, so how do we know this is stereo specific? So stereo, stereo, eh, stereo specific. How do we know that this is stereo specific? The reason we know that is because there's only one beta proton, right? Or the alpha carbon and the beta carbon, they're both stereo centers. Give me a thumbs up if you remember that. We said that when the, both the alpha and the beta carbon are stereo centers, it's stereo specific. So the only way you can answer this question is by drawing a Newman projection, or at least it's not the only way, but it's the way that I prefer to do it, it's the way I teach it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our eyeball and we're going to look down this carbon-carbon bond, okay? And we're going to draw what we see. So I'm going to scribble it. I don't know. I'll scribble it down here. So we'll put the carbon in the back and we've got a carbon in the front. So going straight down, we've got the aromatic ring over here in the back. Or sorry, in the top left, we've got a proton. And over here, we have the bromine. In the back, we have an ethyl group. So this is an ethyl group here. So I'm just going to write ET for ethyl, just to make my life a little easier. So ET. Then I have the proton. Is the proton going to be going down to the right or down to the left? Can anybody tell me? The proton in blue. It's not a trick question. Down to the right or down to the left? The proton in blue. It's gonna, thanks, Savannah. Yeah, it's going down to the right. Yes, there we go. So we have a proton here. And then we have the methyl group here. They didn't write methyl. I'm going to put methyl there. So now what we need to do is we need to put this bromine and this hydrogen, we need them to be anti periplanar to each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the, I'm going to bring the proton over here. I'm going to put the methyl group uh, up here and I'll put the ethyl group down here. Okay, so I'm going to rotate it 120 degrees. And what I end up with is something that looks like this. So just let me redraw it here. Bear with me. So we didn't change anything in the front. So I've got my proton here, my bromine here, and my so I'll put my phenyl here, hydrogen here, and my bromine is still there. Now I'm going to have my hydrogen down here. I'm going to have my methyl group up here. And going down this way, I'm going to have my ethyl group. All right, give me a thumbs up if you're with me so far. Everybody with me at this point? Okay, awesome, awesome. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the elimination, right? So if you're wondering about the mechanism, so the mechanism is this, right? You pull off this proton, you make the double bond, you lose the bromine. So now we're going to do that E2 mechanism. So E2, and we're, E2, and we're going to draw the product that we get. So once we eliminate, the bromine and the proton, which are anti periplanar to each other, you can see that we end up with a double bond. Oops, get my black pen here. So I'm going to make this red carbon the carbon in the front, and then, or, sorry, yeah, and then the carbon in back, I'll make it blue, okay? So I've got a double bond. I've got the red carbon in the front. I've got the blue carbon in the back. Okay, so what's attached to the red carbon? So attached to the red carbon, I have a phenyl over here and I have a proton over here. That's the, the phenyl and the proton. On the same side as the phenyl, I've got the ethyl in the back. So I'll put my ethyl group like this. I'll just draw it out now. And then on the same side as the proton, I've got my methyl. So there you go. So that's the, going to be the major product. It's going to be this product here. All right. Is there going to be a minor product? Yeah, sure. You're going to get the SN2 product. 
as the minor product. So I'll just scribble that over here, just in the interest of fitting it all on the same screen. So that's going to look like this. We're going to have our methyl group here, and then we'll have our ethoxy group here. So that would be the minor product. All right, there you go. You got to know stereospecificity. We, we always ask a question about it. It's one of the things I'm obliged to ask you about. So yeah, you can always count on a question, <clears throat> excuse me, about stereospecificity. Uh, was there another one I wanted to go over? Da, 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 da. Yes, there's a couple other ones that I wanted to go over with you. I wanted to go over J and K, okay? So let's go over to J and K. So again, this is question 7.75. And I wanted to take a look at J with you. I think it's a good one. It's my favorite reaction in organic chemistry. Why? I don't know. It just is. All right. So if we take a secondary alcohol and we just heat it up. <clears throat> so this is just concentrated sulfuric acid and heat. Okay. What small molecule are, what small molecule are we going to lose when we heat an alcohol up? And concentrated acid. What small molecule are we going to We're going to lose water, right? Thanks. Yeah, so whatever it is, Sarah, right, we end up with something plus, plus water. So that means we're going to make a double bond, right? We're going to make an alkene. Now, could anybody describe the major product? Could anybody give me one word that's going to describe the major product when you heat up this secondary alcohol? All right. Okay. So the major product is going to, it's going to be the Zaitsev product. It's going to be the most substituted alkene, All right? So the major product that you would get would be this. Okay. We're going to get this compound, which is Zaitsev. That's going to be our major product. That's always the major product when you heat up an alcohol and acid, but you're also going to get some of the Zaitsev product. All right. We're also going to get some of the Zaitsev product. It's not the prettiest drawing in the world, is it? Anyhow, we're going to get some of this as well. But there's one more product that you're going to get in this reaction um, besides these two. And the only way you would be able to figure that out is if you drew the mechanism or if you're very astute about it. So, you know, what's going to happen is you're going to end up protonating this alcohol. And let's take a look. So we know the major acid in a solution of sulfuric acid is actually hydronium. And so if we protonate that, right, the first step is to convert a poor leaving group into a good leaving group. We're going to end up with this oxonium. So let me scribble in the oxonium, which looks like this. And now we're going to end up getting that oxonium leaving like this, okay? So if that leaves, we're going to end up with this secondary carbocation, which can then undergo a hydride shift like this, to give us a tertiary carbocation. So we end up with this tertiary carbocation. And then after water comes in and acts as the base, I'm kind of running out of space here, so maybe I'll put it down here. So now, as water comes in and acts as a base, you're going to end up pulling off some of these protons too. I'll have to use blue this time. And then we're going to put a double bond on the end like this. So you're going to get all three of these products. Of course, this is going to be our major product, the one I have in the green circle, but you're going to get this product as well and this product down here from the rearrangement that can occur. All right, let's try one more and then we'll we'll move on to chapter eight. And the question, yeah, is 7.75K. Um, this is 7.75K. And with this one, we've got a chiral center in it. So we have a tosylate, and if you remember, a tosylate is a tosylate. Is this a good leaving group or a poor leaving group? Does anybody remember? All right, it's an excellent leaving group, right, Savannah? Great, thank you. So it's a very good leaving group, and then we have chloride. Now chloride is a strong. It's a strong nucleophile, but is it a strong base? No, it's a very weak base, right? How do you know it's a weak base? Well, it's the conjugate base of a strong acid. And then we have DMSO, and DMSO is a polar 
aprotic solvent. And so the main mechanism here, if we have a secondary alkyl halide, okay, or sorry, a secondary um, leaving group, I should say, or a leaving group on a secondary carbon, and then we have a strong nucleophile that's a weak base, we're only going to get one mechanism occurring here. Could anybody tell me what mechanism this is? Remember, we have a good nucleophile, but it's a weak base, so there's no elimination. What's the only mechanism that's going to occur here? There's only one kind of reaction that's going to occur. Exactly. Thank you. It's an SN2 reaction, isn't it? Right. The only thing that's going to happen is SN2. That is it. That is all. Now, keep in mind, this is a chiral center. And so when you do an SN2, you get inversion of configuration. And so what we're going to do is we're going to replace this with our chloride, but we're going to flip the wedge to a dash and we're done. And that's it. And that's the only product we're going to get in this case. And so, again, you want to make sure that you know the table that covers all the different types of bases and nucleophiles. And then you want to go over the table where you have primary, secondary, and tertiary substrates. And make sure that you know that and you're able to solve problems like this one, like question 7.75 and 7.76 that we covered last class. So I think those are excellent problems uh, that make great food for thought. And, um, you know, repetition is one of the mothers of, of learning, I guess, or at least that's what I've heard said. And so I think that the more of these practice problems you do, um, the better off you'll be. And the, and the better you'll be, or the better off you'll be in Chapter 8 as well, because, um, again, organic chemistry is a very much an additive subject. What you learn in Chapter 7 is going to apply in Chapter 8, Chapter 9, Chapter 10, and, of course, uh, Chapter 11. So let me just say one more thing before I end this video. And let me just go down here where I have a little more room. So something that, um, you know, kind of where we are in the course right now, okay? I told you that the real kind of heavy organic chemistry starts in Chapter 7, and we just finished Chapter 7. Today we're going to move into Chapter 8, which covers alkenes, so alkene chemistry. Then we're going to take a step and go way forward into um, the chapter on NMR, so NMR. Anyhow, so that's kind of a departure a little bit. But then we come back in chapter nine and we study the chemistry of alkynes. And then in chapter 10, we study free radicals, the so radicals. And just so you know, so chapter 11, which is the last chapter we covered, the name of that chapter is synthesis. So synthesis. And what chapter 11 covers mainly, it covers mainly chapters seven, eight, nine, and 10. Okay. It's kind of a a review of all four of those chapters or putting them together and, you know, really mooring your, your synthetic prowess. So, so again, remember organic chemistry is very much an additive subject. So once you've committed, um, you know, these tables to memory and you, you think you've mastered the material, again, it's going to serve you for the whole rest of your time in organic chemistry. So it's not going to be uh, time wasted whatsoever. All right. Well, we'll end it there. And then we're going to start up chapter eight, in a little, little bit.